Taylor Walker from the Abbey Crows, and you're listening to the Coaches Panel. Shannon Hearn from the West Coast Eagles. This is Nathan Jones from the Melbourne Football Club. Phil Davis from the GRS Giants. That's Brad Aver from the Port Adelaide Football Club, and you're listening to the Coaches Panel. Hello, you with MJ. Welcome to another Coaches Panel podcast as we talk through who I believe are the most relevant players for Supercoach, Dream Team, and AFL Fantasy in 2019. Landing at number 14 today in the countdown, getting real close now to the top 10. To talk Matt Crouch, who I've got at number 14. Tim from the Coaches Panel joins me. Hello, mate. How are you, buddy? I'm doing pretty well. G'day, everyone. It's been a little while since we've had your week or so, but I'm pretty excited to talk about this Adelaide Crows midfielder. He's shown over many years he's a capable premium option across all the formats. And does this younger Crouch have another level on his output? We will talk about that in a moment. He's just 23 years old, a midfielder, and his best scores last year came in the same game against North Melbourne. For AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, 136 was the score against the Kangaroos, while Supercoach, it was a 131. He'll be uh, priced for you in the formats at just over 550000 in Supercoach. That's based off an average of 101.5. While in Dream Team and Fantasy, he's going to set you a little bit over 750000 uh, about 761 in AFL Fantasy. That's due to a seasonal average of 104.8. When we talk about Matt Crouch, Tim, he wasn't immune uh, from the dreaded injury curse that the Adelaide Football Club ha- had last year. Round two in that first half, things were looking good for Matt Crouch owners. If you started with him, you were thinking, oh, yep, this is looking fantastic. Then ping goes the hamstring, and yet another player in the Adelaide Football Club went down with the Crows injury curse last year. Yeah, that's right. He was a popular pick last year for much the same reasons as this year, and... Um course if you started with him you would have got burnt by that first one um but of course when he came back he was uh, just as good as always well that's the thing when you talk about matt crouch there is some occasional knock on his fantasy ceiling and i do want to talk about that but you remove that injury impacted game and it's always dangerous taking games out of um what they were able to deliver but you know Round one, he comes out and knocks out a 123 in Dream Team in Fantasy, 105 in Supercoach. You're right. You're thinking, this is awesome. I've jumped on board a winner here because he flew home in 2017. Then that injury kind of impacts. But from round six in his return against Gold Coast, right throughout the rest of the year, there was only one match across every single format where he failed to score above 90. During his games played last year, which he played 18 possible of the 22 games, He had 12 AFL Fantasy and Dream Team scores over 100, six of them over 120, while in Supercoach, 12 Supercoach tons and four of them over 120. And if you take that injury-impacted game out, so it's just full healthy games, we're talking about a seasonal average in Supercoach of 104, while in AFL Fantasy, it's a 109. In AFL Fantasy, an average like that, mate, that puts you as a top 10 midfielder. It does. I think there are a few guys around about that last year, weren't they? Around about the 110, but not too many above it. Maybe just Tom Mitchell and uh, McRae, really. Mm. So that pretty much puts him on par with the third best, the third line of uh, of scorers. And of course, he's done that right through his career. Like even in juniors, he averaged 38 possessions. I don't know what his uh, fantasy scoring was at that time, but 38 possessions in the Tank Cup was um, pretty impressive. So. He's uh, just carried right on with that in the seniors. Yeah, he has. Even in 2017, it was a reinforcement of what we saw from the injury-free games of Matt Crouch. In 2017, 22 games, an average of 106 in AFL Fantasy, 13 tonnes, five of them um, over the 120, including a 150 in the final week of footy for the year. And that grand final for your finals, he would have been a huge win for you in that matchup. Uh, while we're talking in super coach, it was an average of 110, 15 tons, nine of them over 120. And in super coach in 2017, from round 10 up until round 21, his lowest score was 100. He's one of these guys that just consistently finds a way to win the ball. He's not dependent upon others to farm the ball out for him to his scores to go big. He wins his own ball, gets plenty of that contested possession, knows how to link up on the outside, grabs the outside uncontested marks, and it's not been uh, uncommon to see him get on the end and kick himself a sausage roll. 
No, that's right. And you touched on his one big one at the end of 2017. I think from memory, the Crows went to town on Freo in that game. He had Sloan would have got something massive as well as Crouch and Jacobs and uh, several of them just absolutely smashed uh, Freo. So um, if you're mentioning his ceiling, that's definitely one example where he does have it. Um, certainly his big knock when he came into the, the AFL was fitness. Mm. So as I said, he had an average of 38 touches in the juniors, but um, fitness was his thing in the AFL. But you can see he's a bit like most players. He just gradually gets a bit fitter each year and he, yeah. said he gets a few marks. So he's getting around, he's getting a few more loose plus sixes than he did in his first couple of seasons and uh, just sort of trying to fill the whole stat sheet these days. Yeah, he seems to find a way to do that. You know, his, his tackle numbers were marginally down last year on what he'd done over the past few seasons. And his his time on ground is certainly not enormous. But when he's on the field, he, he just finds a way to, to win the ball, to farm it out. Um, if you are going for full Fox territory and you're wanting to start to see some of his kick-to-handball ratio improve. We're starting to see that over the past two years where he's now kicking over the, you know, the 30 possessions per game, 32 and 33, and still kicking the ball, you know, 13 times per game on average. So we are seeing some of this there, but because he is an inside ball-winning midfielder, the handball count is always going to be um, supreme um, when it comes to uh, how he disposes of the ball. I think you could probably say he offers marginal value. There's still value there because that 30-odd in AFL Fantasy Dream Team, that low 50 score is in his seasonal average. Like I said, you take that out, it's a 109 in Fantasy. It's a 104 in Supercoach. So so there is a little bit of value there, and he's shown before he can go 110 for a season in Supercoach, and shown, again, outside of the injury last year, he's there and thereabouts in AFL Fantasy. I think probably the biggest question mark that was a little bit of an unknown, more so than a question mark about Matt Crouch, is we still haven't seen what this Adelaide Crows midfield looks like when they get probably their four big midfield stars all in there together. With Brad Crouch getting injured last year, it meant even though there was the inclusion of Bryce Gibbs, we still haven't seen the Crouch brothers, Sloan and Gibbs all coexist in the same midfield. I don't think it's a huge fantasy detractor for it. It's just a bit of an unknown that coaches are going to be waiting and seeing what impact, if any, that has. Yeah, that's right. And I've actually had a bit of a look to see how it's gone over the last couple of years. And uh, you're right. So obviously, Brad Crouch and Gibbs have never played together. So mm. you've never had all of them together. So you don't have data on that. Um, the ones you do have, it's sort of a bit of a bit either way. So it doesn't really suggest there'd be too much to worry about at all for Crouch. So when Sloan and Gibbs have played together with Matt Crouch, yeah. Crouch averaged 119. But um, that was pretty much all exclusively after the bye yeah. in 2018 when he flew home. So whether it's related or not, who knows. When um, Sloan and Brad Crouch both played, Matt averaged 101. Um, so there's one example where two people played and he averaged less, and mm. the other example where two different guys played and he averaged a lot more. So, you know, it's it's hard to read too much into that, really. Yeah, it, it's one of those ones that, again, it's, it's such an unknown, but I, it gives you enough indication that, the way Adelaide choose to use him, which is playing to his strengths, which is in and under the packs, winning the ball and getting in the contest. You're not going to see a drastic drop away of his basement of his scores because his fantasy basement is really, really strong. I think if there's any impact, um, whether it be with the new rule changes that are coming in that are designed to speed up the game or the inclusion of Brad Crouch inside that midfield unit, um, maybe some of his ceiling gets a little bit of a chip but I still think there's value in the selection. The other factor is he, he is certainly a tag target. Now, most teams are going to choose to go after Rory Sloan, who's proven you can impact more than Matt. But if, you know, Crouch certainly flies out of the gate, he may attract some level of attention. But I think the big kind of thing that's worth discussing when it comes to Matt Crouch before we talk about, you know, drafts is there's so many incredible options for us from his buy round that it starts to become not just a, which one do you want to choose to start with? It almost has to become, which one can I do, um, can I not do without over the first 13 weeks of the year? Because he shares his buy around with Patrick Cripps, Stephen Canelio, Josh Kelly, um, and then the value options of Dustin Martin, teammate Rory Sloan, um, even his brother Brad Crouch, 
Tim Taranto, Jacob Hopper. Uh, like, there's so many guys. And that's before we even talk about any North or Gold Coast guys in the midfield you may be considering. Not that you should really be doing that. But it starts to become more of a... You can only have so many of them before the buy round. Which ones are the ones you need to get and need to get right over those first 13 weeks? Yeah, it's a really good point because whether you start with him or upgrade to him early, it's still the same impact in that you've got him at his buy round. Yeah. And, um, you know, is it too late to wait until after that all the buy rounds are finished before you go and get him? Yeah. You know, would you want to complete a team by that point? So um, it really becomes a case of you're not starting him necessarily just because he might be a little bit of value. So if you think he averages the same as last year, he's, what, four or five points underpriced. But mm. um, you'd, you'd want a guy who's going to be in your top eight midfielders because he'll be keeping out other guys of um, of that buy round. Well, across you're right, across all the formats, it's kind of universally agreed at this stage that Patrick Cripps is going to be in, in top eight to ten um, contention if he stays fit. Similar with the Josh Kelly. Uh, Canelio is going to be knocking down the door across the formats. If Dusty gets back to his best, um, he needs to come into the consideration. So already just on that one buy round, you've got four very viable top ten options before you even talk about Matt Crouch. And it is becoming the, which one, yes, his value, but so are many other players this year. Which one of these guys is going to most hurt you to not own over those first 13 weeks? Because round 15 starts to become the earliest. Because how many midfield premiums, I know it depends on the overall 18 in your side, but is three midfield premiums from the same buy round before the buy about... Tim, the limitation you can get away with before you start feeling a little bit uneasy about how many midfield points you're going to generate in the buy round? Look, I'd, I'd think so. You probably wouldn't want to carry too many more than uh, three premium mids from a buy round through their own buy round. Mm. Um, I mean, normally if you've got more than three, some people, even if they've got the luxuries, might even trade around the buyers, but you can't do that with Matt's because it's the last one. Yeah, oh, well, ex- exactly right. So that's where it starts to become the variation. Yes, I think he's got some value in him. I, I think he's definitely in the contention and in the conversation as a, a top eight, top ten midfielder for the year because I have I do have him locked in in a number of formats for me right now. I really believe there's the ceiling about him. There's the scoring consistency about him. And I don't think the inclusion of his brother inside the midfield unit is going to affect him or his scoring. I think, if anything, it's going to start kicking out guys that have previously had midfield rotations such as a Richard Douglas these are the guys that are going to be farmed out of that kind of rotational responsibility and let the these really big name Crows midfielders get in so I, I don't see it impacting his scoring per se um, I think it's going to impact others the question is how do you rank and rate these guys that he shares his buy around yes he's value but so are so many other players it's now got to be about who do you think off that buy round rank him out and if he fits in that top three, then you probably can still build that case for starting him. But if he's fourth in your ranking from that buy round of Cripps, Cornelio, Kelly, Dusty, Sloan, Taranto, um, and the other team members that aren't as hugely relevant, then it's going to be a hard case to start him. Yeah, that's right. That's a pretty fair summary of it. And look, if you did decide he's in the top three, well, it's probably not a terrible idea to start him because you do have that uh, discount from what he, his true average is last year. Correct. I mean, assuming you don't believe he'll get injured again. And look, to be honest, I know a few guys got injured last year, but um, Matt's been pretty durable. He hasn't. Well, really that's right. He played 22 injury, games in 2017. You know, in 2016, kind of his, his breakout year, he played 20 games. And so, you know, outside of one hamstring, basically, he, ha- he hasn't missed a game for three in it you know, for three years pretty much. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's a, a durability question mark over him, you know, like there is around his brother. Um, let's talk drafts, though, because for me, I, I do have Matt locked away in a couple of the formats. Are you similar, by the way, before we get to draft? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be starting him at the moment. Probably not super coach. Okay. The super coach is just because super coach scoring seemed to change slightly last year in that you see Matt's... Uh, Average went down in Super Coach, yes, but did. if you take out his injury, it's pretty much gone up every year in fantasy. Yeah, and there are there are a few players who seem to sort of change a little bit in Super Coach scoring last year. So I wonder if it's just the nature of it has uh, hurt him a little bit. 
Yeah, and you know, probably one of the two knocks on his development as a youngster was around his fitness base, which he's certainly developing, and his disposal efficiency. But that's not uncommon for a player that's winning the ball and the coal face like he is. And so, yeah, I think if there is a format, he drifts away for people. Maybe it is super coach, especially with the value of guys like Dusty and his teammate in Rory Sloan that have shown a similar or a comparable scoring ceiling in terms of seasonal average. In terms of a draft, though, um, he really is a deserving M1. Uh, as I said, I believe he's a top 10 midfielder. Um, definitely an AFL fantasy and dream team right in that conversation in Supercoach. So I, I think he's a deserving M1, but I don't see him going inside the first round of, of any format of draft unless you've got a really bullish Crows fan. Uh, and even then, they're probably going for Rory Laird first over him. But I think it's more likely a second round selection. And in some drafts, he may drift out to a third, but that's as far as it goes. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I think so. There's um, there's probably a couple of uh, Ruckman that would go before him this year pretty yeah. comfortably. Um, and just because of his average last year, I mean, most people won't sit there at a draft and remember that he tweaked a hammy halfway through one game, so they'll just assume he averaged 104 rather yeah. than 109 um, or slightly off in super coach. And there's plenty of midfielders who did average more than him last year. I don't know how many off the top of my head, but it might be sort of five to ten or something like that. Yeah. Um, even maybe a couple more. So, yeah, he won't go first round. But um, oh, it, there are a few people, however, who really do love the Crouch name. Yeah. Especially Matt with what he's done. So they'll look at it and go, oh, Matt Crouch is going to be awesome. So I reckon if you really want him, you'd have to take him in the second round. Uh, yeah. You're right. He might drift a little. Um, but certainly... It'd be a worthy M1 or M2, depending on who your first pick is. Oh, yeah, I think so. It all depends where your draft positioning is. Um, if you're early in that first round, it, it's unlikely that he's there late in the the second for your second selection. Because I, I am seeing a lot of, you know, people with their, um, the draft doctor's mark, you know, kind of mock simulator or people starting their own drafts now. It's kind of, if they're later in the first round, they're choosing a dual position opportunity like a Laird or a Lloyd and then locking in someone like a Matt Crouch, Zach Merritt, Clayton Oliver, Patrick Cripps as their M1, but their second selection. So, yeah, I think that's where he's going to go in a lot of drafts is probably second round. But, yeah, maybe you get lucky, um, you know, getting him in the early in the third. Gosh, that'd be great if you're a, one of those early picks, you know, you lock yourself McRae with your first selection and then you can lock in, you know, a Matt Crouch at M2 with your second or third pick. Yeah, that's You're winning the draft right there, aren't you? Yeah, I think you'd be pretty happy if you got him at M2 um, for Crouch. All right. And in, term, in terms of a keeper league, though, I reckon he'd be... Uh, He'd be every chance to be a first-round pick. He's um, inside that pick, isn't he? You know, he's one of those guys similar to Zach Merritt, who we spoke about earlier, where you may not have to use your first pick on him in a in a keeper league draft, but he's certainly got the potential to be one, and it's not a bad pick. But he's definitely gone inside the top twenty selections. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's he's only twenty three. Yeah. Like he feels like he's been around a while, but he's he's got ten years left, and. Unlike some players, there's some players who go up big and drop down big in averages, like Jack Redden has been yo-yoing a bit in his career. Yeah. I think Mark Murphy sprung a 110 season on us and then never really hit 100 again for about six or seven years. Yeah. Um, Matt Crouch, just a bit like uh, a Tom Mitchell light version, it's just like, you just know he's going to get the footy. Like He's yeah. really not likely to average under 100 at any point in the next few years. No, I think he's a fantastic selection. Good luck getting him out of the hands of anyone in a keeper league if it's an existing one because they, they've been enjoying 100-plus seasonal averages over the past couple of years. And you're right, th- that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Hey, Tim, appreciate your thoughts today as we talked about Matt Crouch. No worries. Cheers. If you want to go and check out the article, it's at coachespanel.tv, as are the links. If you want to support the Coaches Panel and join our Patreon and get some early access content and exclusive content to our Patreon members. Number 13 in the 50 most relevant lands tomorrow, and it's our final teen inclusion, and it's a big fantasy footy name.